as you can see winter is back this is a 31 degree snow it's actually a beautiful snow because it's kind of a wet heavy snow and it clings to stuff even this geez that's just a horrifically ugly bush that's a rhododendron with mostly dead leaves on it and about five live leaves but with the snow it actually looks kind of nice it's like a van gogh painting okay now brewster loves the snow he'll probably start rolling on his back at any time I don't know what it is about this yard that fascinates him. We have to come here every day. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> All right. Okay. All right. Good boy. There were two deer on the road yesterday when we came through here. And we were coming back from our walk. I got him all juiced up. Probably still smells them. Easy. Stay. Stay there. Good boy. Stay. So I finished the landmark the Saudis the other day. have to say what a work of genius the level of detail the one million names place names the what where when why how the level of information he ferrets out about a war the last 27 years is incredible. And I'm talking about YouTube a minute ago, but think about the world of 430 to 410 BC. No YouTube, no internet, no telephone, no radio, no television. No, nothing. You can't say, hey Siri, what was Brasidas doing around Amphipolis? Or, hey Siri, what happened to Nicias at Syracuse? You want answers to those questions? You've got to go find out yourself. Thucydides finds out everything. If you want more detail about the Peloponnesian War, you're insane. There's so much detail that he gives you that, good lord, it's not a book for everybody. It's the kind of book you close, and you think, okay, that was good, now I have to reread it. Because there was so much there that I couldn't possibly take it all in. I don't know who these people are, what these places are. I don't really know what it means. Thucydides gives it all to you. Unfortunately, his account only lasts from 431 BC to 411 BC, and the war lasts until 404 BC. Obviously, he died before he finished his work. So what did the world lose? That's a rabbit track, excuse me, a squirrel track right there. I told you once before, sometimes they look a lot like a deer track. When they're right together, they can look like a big hoof if this, this was over here a little closer. More squirrel. What did the world lose? What detail was lost? We'll never know. 
how Thucydides lived on. That final seven years of the war might have really come to life. He might have learned a whole lot more. Maybe Athens had opportunities to win still, but they didn't. Now, before I read Thucydides, I read the landmark Herodotus. <laughs> that's, a, that's Greek history up to and including the Persian War. And Herodotus is a lot different than Thucydides. It might seem the, the same at first blush, but they're really quite different guys. Thucydides is a facts, just a facts please kind of guy. Herodotus is filled with all sorts of crazy stories. And he feels much more ancient. It's only 50 years earlier, but it feels like it's a thousand years earlier. Thucydides doesn't talk about the gods or the spirits or anything like that. He just sticks to the cold, hard facts. It's got a billion of them. Herodotus, for example, at one point in describing Africa, which was a far off distant continent, even though Greece is fairly close to Africa, just across the Mediterranean, but to him, I guess anything south of Egypt was really a mysterious place. And at one point, he says, there are places in Africa where the sun rises in the west and sets in the east. That's how remote it is. <laughs> I found that to be great. He's a brilliant guy. He's a brilliant guy, but he's living in a time, 2,500 years ago, where basic understanding of the world, of the solar system, of the universe, of anything related to the physical world is limited. He tells another story these giant ants in Africa, excuse me, in India. The people want to go into India, go into ant country and get sugar or whatever it is that the ants create, honey. But the ants are huge and ferocious. I think he describes them as the size of a small dog, which would be Brewster there. An ant the size of Brewster. Thousands of ants the size of Brewster. Ooh, that's quite a wind. I know the sound quality on this one is going to be terrible. It comes a hurricane force gale. Anyway, so the Indians ride camels into ant country. Now, if you're a smart Indian, you grab a female camel with a child, with a baby camel. And you separate the two. Why is that? ride your camel into ant country. The other guys on the other camels ride in alongside you. You steal the sugar off the gigantic ant mounds. The ants come out of the holes and begin to attack. Thousands of them, millions of them, the size of Brewster. 
You're running for your life now. Your camel is running for its life. You want to be on the fastest camel. And that camel is generally a mama camel racing to get back to her baby whom she thinks is in some sort of distress. So you'll beat the other camels. That last place guy on the slowest camel, he'll be overtaken by the ants and devoured to the bone. The guy and the camel. That's a Herodotus story. That's why you read Herodotus, to get good stuff like that. That's how the world appeared to people 2,500 years ago. But Thucydides, no. He never does anything like that. The men are merely men. Their motives are their motives. They give great speeches. They're highly intelligent. Now, how does Thucydides get all this information? Well, it could be what at the time seemed like a terrible break, but turned out to be the break of a lifetime. And that is this. Thucydides starts the war as a general in that war. He's obviously a young guy because he lives all the way to the end of it and past the end of it, probably from some sort of noble family. He's a general in the war. He tells us that. He also had the plague. He tells us that. And he's called into action when, around the time when Brasidas was up there taking over Amphipol uh, Amphipolis. He's called into action. His report of his action seems fairly heroic. But we learn later that Thucydides was exiled from Athens for 20 years. I would imagine it had something to do with that role up there in the north. Because Brasidas, the Spartan general, was pretty successful up there. Even though Thucydides seemed to do his job, perhaps that's not the way the Athenians saw it. Anyway, so Thucydides is banished. Can't go back to Athens. What's he do? Well, he says he goes to the Peloponnese, which is where Sparta is. And he said there he had the leisure to observe events as he chose. So Thucydides is an Athenian. He knows everybody in Athens. He's a general. He knows all the military figures. He knows Pericles, the big leaders. But now he's in the Peloponnese. Presumably that means Sparta itself. So he gets to know them too. So he's got the ability to see things from both sides. Oh, this is gonna be ugly. Anyway, so Thucydides spends his 20 years of exile doing what he does. Talking, observing, learning what he has to learn. And it turns out to be the greatest historical account of anything written in ancient times. See you tomorrow. And by the way, look at this lovely weather. Every day, no matter what, we're out here. Every day. <laughs> and Brewster loves it no matter what.